Hi everyone, and thanks for coming out on this uh, this day after a holiday. I hope everyone's uh, doing all right today. Uh, thank you for coming. We're here with David Scarbeck, who's a, a lecturer in political economy at King's College of London, uh, to talk about his book, The Social Order of the Underworld. Now, I was uh, I was intrigued to find out about this book uh, because you don't usually think of prison gangs or, or prisons as being a place of order. But just like other places that seem sort of anarchic, there is an underlying order to things. And I, as I've been reading the book, I, I'm only uh, about a third of the way through, but it, it's just been fascinating. And I'm looking forward to, to reading the rest and to hearing from David today. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to David. Hey, Matt, thanks very much. I'm really excited to be here to, to chat with you guys about my new book. Um, so Matt, as Matt mentioned, it's about uh, the American prison system. And in particular, I spent a lot of time focusing on prison gangs and understanding what are gangs, what do they do, uh, how do they organize themselves internally, how do they interact with other gang members, other correctional officers, and I guess maybe more importantly, why do prison gangs exist and sometimes in places and, and not at others? Um, so sociologists and criminologists have spent a lot of time studying the prison community, and they've done you know, really a lot of first-rate, excellent work on the subject. Um, but I wanted to come at the, the, the question of prison social order from an economics and a political science uh, perspective. Uh, so that's what I do in the book. Um, I take ideas from new institutional economics, and I try to explain how informal institutions work in prison, how effective they are, how stable they are, how robust they are, and how they form and evolve over time. <clears throat> so um, my general interest as an economist is to understand governance institutions. And governance institutions are the structures in society that uh, define and enforce property rights, that provide the foundations to facilitate trade and commerce between people, and they help people to act cooperatively to produce collective and public goods. So when governance institutions work well, um, communities do well. Okay, when governance institutions are effective, there is exchange and there's peace. When governance institutions fail, which they do for a variety of reasons, um, then that undermines market activity, it undermines civil society, and it gives rise to conflict and violence. So the broad finding that I bring to prison, um, the broad finding in, in economics and political science is that the quality of governance institutions is crucial. That's what depends and determines kind of the social outcomes in a particular community. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm interested in understanding is, is those governance institutions. And when we look around the world, it's obvious that lots of governance is provided by governments, uh, but by no means all of it. And in fact, in many places, failed and weak states, governments do a very poor job of providing governance. Nonetheless, there's still a lot of market activity that takes place in these countries. So what I want to understand better by looking at the prison system is how these informal or extra legal, outside of formal legal system, these extra legal governance institutions work. Um, so when you go to prison, when you visit prisons, I've pr visited a variety of different prisons, um, two things are, are, I guess, are kind of somewhat immediately obvious, um, especially when co combined with the academic literature. The first is that when you go to prison, there are lots of formal governance institutions, right? There are, there are guards who are monitoring people's interactions, who will intervene if violence takes place. Uh, there are, are bars that will keep you locked into a cell. And while that constrains your freedom, it also prevents other people from coming in and, and taking your stuff uh, or harming you. So in prison, there's a substantial amount of formal governance. Um, however, the second fact uh, that I kind of argue for in the book is that even with this formal governance, there's still a substantial arena in which inmates have to interact with each other in the informal arena. Um, there's a, there's a, they have demand for governance that officials can't or won't provide. Okay? And so maybe I'll just give a, a, a two examples of the types of extra legal governance that inmates want. Uh, one is that, as, as many of you may imagine, uh, and hopefully not experienced, when you're in prison, uh, you feel vulnerable. You know, there's potentially people around you who would like to hurt you, who would like to take advantage of you, would like to take your property. And so on the margin, I argue that inmates have a, have a strong demand to provide a little more protection, or maybe a lot more protection 
over what the officials can provide to them. So that's one way in which inmates need extra legal governance. The second is that prisons forbid a broad range of goods and services that inmates have a substantial demand for. Drugs, alcohol, tobacco, a variety of other goods and services that inmates want, officials won't provide to them. So in order for them to get access to these goods and services, they must rely on the illicit economy, the underground economy. And unlike in traditional markets and legal markets, operating in the underground economy means that people who are, who are engaged in that can't rely on the formal governance institutions. So if two inmates make a deal to um, you know, trade some heroin, to buy some heroin or distribute some, some drugs or alcohol, and the other side of the party doesn't hold up his side, you can't go and complain to prison officials, right? You can't go to a prison guard and complain that someone didn't give you the quantity or the quality of heroin that you demanded. So for inmates to get access to these uh, prohibited items, this contraband, they need to engage in trade with people. And to engage in trade, they need to create the governance institutions that allow that to work. <clears throat> the, the thesis that I pursue in the book is that prison gangs form to provide these two types of extra legal governance. Um, historically, people join gangs and gangs start because people are unsafe, because they're afraid of victimization from other inmates, and they don't feel that officials provide enough protection to them. Uh, second, um, in order for these markets to work and they can't rely on the formal governance, uh, inmates have to come up with some way to provide assurance if you want to trade with someone who you don't know or don't know well, and you're worried that they're not going to hold up their side of the bargain, there needs to be some way to overcome that or else the exchange not, is not going to take place. <clears throat> um, and, and that's where prison gangs step in. So um, in California in particular, prison gangs operate in what I call a community responsibility system. And what that means is that everyone who enters the prison, everyone who, who lives in prison, has to affiliate with some group. It's very often a gang or a racial affiliation, so not a hardcore gang member, but a, a loose affiliation with a race-based group of inmates. And in groups like these, everyone in that group is responsible for each individual person's behavior. So for example, if an inmate um, purchases drugs on credit or, or receives drugs with the promise to, to return twice as many drugs the next week, Everyone that he's affiliated with, everyone in his group or his gang, is responsible for the debt that he incurs. Okay? So this is a very important um, social relationship to create. Okay? If there's one individual and you know that his uh, affiliates, his, his associates, are going to withhold the debts, his obligations, they're going to hold up and they're going to be responsible for those, then it doesn't matter if you don't know that particular individual. If you know that everyone in that gang has a good reputation for um, holding up their side of the bargain and for paying the debts of their members who, who incur those debts, then you know that you can trade and interact with that person and um, th there's an assurance provided there. So gangs act as a sort of information uh, node and by interacting with, these indiv with, the, with a gang, individuals can engage in more trade in the underground economy uh, than they could in their absence. Um, so to maybe think again about an example, if someone uses or purchases drugs on, on credit and doesn't repay those drugs, then the gang of the person who sold the drug can go to the, to the, to the recipient of the drugs and demand that, that they be compensated. And in California, uh, that compensation can come in a uh, kind of a variety of different ways. One is that it might be that all members of that person's gang will pay the debt. For their, for their comrade, for their, their member. It may be that they force him to do some work for the other gang. It's not uncommon for uh, someone who is in debt in prison to assault enemies of the people to whom he owes that debt. So that's an important way that gangs force their members to work off debts. Um, unfortunately, a very real uh, common outcome in prison is that uh, that member will be assaulted to the satisfaction of uh, the drug dealer's gang. And the way that works is that an individual will not be assaulted by the person that he owes money to, but his own gang will assault him in a controlled manner to the satisfaction of the person to whom that debt is owed. So those are just a couple of examples of ways that a group will hold themselves collectively responsible for each individual member's actions.
And if they have a reputation for doing this consistently, that means that even if a, a drug dealer doesn't know a particular individual, he can still trade with that person um, because he knows that the gangs are going to be responsible for the debt. So it's providing assurance, a sort of guarantee of performance. <clears throat> so, um, you know, some, some people might say that this is an argument that gangs are a good thing. And uh, I wouldn't quite go that far um, for, for a variety of reasons, but at least one is that um, gangs are sort of coming into existence, coming into power because of absences or shortcomings in our formal governance institutions. Um, the officials may be the people who should be protecting gangs rather than forcing inmates to rely on other inmates, for example. So at the very least, this isn't an argument that gangs are kind of an ideal uh, set of organizations that govern our communities, um, uh, but sort of a second best argument to explain why they exist and, and do the things that they do. Um, maybe I'll just say a few things about kind of what alternative explanations are. Um, so something that's striking about prison gangs that, say, in the case of California, is the prison system existed for more than 100 years, more than a century before any groups like the prison gangs today came into existence. So prison gangs are crucial today. If you go to prison, you have to, you have to join a gang. Uh, when I visit these prisons and I, and I talk to officials, they always, you know, they promise me, they assure me that, you know, even if, if, you, if you came to prison, you'd have to find some group to affiliate with. Um, so it's kind of striking that they're so important today, and yet they were absent for more than 100 years um, in the history of that prison system. So part of the book is trying to make an argument about that. And, and there, you see a similar relationship in other state prison systems. So if prison gangs are important today, why don't they always exist? And the argument that I make in the book is that it's changes in the inmate demographics that's the most important predictor for when prison gangs emerge and uh, where they emerge. So in California and many places throughout the United States, the prison setting, the prison populations uh, 40 and 50 years ago was dramatically smaller than it is today. Okay? Um, in, the, in California, it was around 25,000 inmates in 1950. And in recent years, it's been as high as 180,000 inmates, okay? So the community in which an inmate lives and interacts with people just has dramatically shifted over the last 40 or 50 years. Now, this is crucial for the explanation of prison gangs. Prison gangs are costly organizations to operate. Um, it, it takes a lot of organization, a lot of information communication to do, the, do what they do well. Um, and inmates you know, would rather, you know, kind of ex save the expense in, in, in bearing those costs. So many people might not wish to join a prison gang. In the earlier period, when you had small prison populations, individuals' reputations were relatively better known, okay? It was much easier to know who was trustworthy. And as a result, you didn't have to rely on that gang-based assurance or uh, guarantee to trade with someone. Uh, unfortunately, as we, the United States has increasingly incarcerated more and more people, it's undermined the ability for this decentralized governance to be effective. And as a result, there's been uh, a greater demand for governance than has been supplied, and gangs have kind of stepped in to fill this governance vacuum. So a lot of my argument um, has to explain, or it tries to explain why gangs existed now and, and don't, didn't exist prior. And the substantial increase in incarceration is kind of a primary driver in, in trying to explain that. So I look at a bunch of inmate demographic data in the book. I look at a lot of the history of the formation of these gangs, rely on a lot of interviews with inmates today, getting their perspective on you know, kind of how do the gangs work, how do they feel about the gangs, um, what do they wish was an alternative to the gangs. Um, so I try to provide kind of a lot of rich detail um, about how gang governance works in America today. Uh, there's two common explanations that are, are counter to mine uh, that have nothing to do with inmate demographics. Uh, the first is the claim that prison gangs form because gangs are an excellent vehicle for violence. And so the argument is that there are violent inmates who wish to be more violent and the gang helps them to do that. Uh, the problem is that prison gangs have increasingly become much more important and much more common since the 1970s. But since the 1970s, there's been a dramatic decrease in prison violence. So inmate on inmate homicides declined 94% between 1973 and 2003. Okay, In 2003, the homicide rate in prison was lower than it is in the general community. Okay, So there's been a dramatic decline in uh, homicides and assaults, in suicides, a variety of other violence indicators during the same period that prison gangs have become much more common. So if prison gangs are forming to promote violence, 
uh, they're not doing a very good job of it on that. Uh, the second explanation for why prison gangs form is to promote racism or hateful ideologies. And again, this isn't uh, an unintuitive or, or unobvious explanation. There's something that rings true about it. Many of these people have alarming uh, tattoos, uh, paraphernalia that promotes and is very explicit about the fact that they dislike people from other uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. The problem here is, again, uh, about explaining the, the, the trend over time. Uh, prison gangs have become much more important in the last 40 years. But since the 1940s, uh, surveys and measures of racism and segregation and discrimination have all been declining and declining substantially. So if prison gangs form to promote racism, we would expect them to be more common in a time when people were more racist, but instead the opposite is true. So those are kind of the two, two conventional wisdoms for why prison gangs exist. And I think that they don't really fit well with the general data. And so instead, I, I argue the, the governance theory of prison gangs, that inmates require extra legal governance and that given huge prison populations, gangs are the efficient providers of that governance. They provide protection at relatively low cost, and they're able to facilitate self-enforce and exchange uh, better than alternative inmate um, social organizations that, that that might be come up with. So um, that's a little bit about my book. I also examine how they control street gangs from behind bars, and they're able to conduct a kind of a widespread taxation of drug sales in Los Angeles in particular. Uh, one of the other chapters examines the internal organization of, of prison gangs. And so, you know, commonly we think of, of prison gangs as kind of, uh, you know, kind of low-level, unsophisticated organizations. Uh, but in the research I did for this book, I show that actually they have fairly elaborate internal organizations. Some gangs even have extensive written constitutions that outline the specific um, positions within a gang, how they're elected, how there's checks and balances between different parts of the organization and about how even impeachment and uh, complaint procedures take place within these gangs. Uh, so in, in a sense, these gangs are, are very um, sophisticated relative to what the depiction uh, often is in the news, but they're not that sophisticated relative to any other organization. So my argument is that we should understand gangs with the same set of tools, economics, that we use to understand other organizations. And then it's not surprising to then see that these groups uh, come up with written rules, there's membership requirements, because that's the same thing that we see in just about every organization, from educational institutions, religious organizations, cultural and, and civil society organizations. So it shouldn't be that surprising to then see similar um, internal governance institutions as the ones that the, that the gangs provide. Um, so anyways, I, I'd love to chat with you a bit, and, uh, and happy to hear any questions. Thank you, David. Our first question is from Antoinette Sapaco. Are women's prisons the same? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that, that's a really great question. And one of the things that I try to do in the book, because the, the evidence or the data is not as, as broadly available as I'd like to have, um, is to try and find out not just where are prison gangs important, but where aren't they important. And according to my argument, the same factors that make prison gangs important in some areas, if absent, should mean we shouldn't see prison gangs there. <clears throat> and when you go and study women's prisons in, in California, where there's kind of the best evidence I, I'm, and I'm kind of focus on, um, it turns out that it's supportive of my argument. So women's uh, prison populations have always been a tiny fraction of the male prison populations. Okay, The highest, the largest size of the female prison population in California ever is about 15,000 inmates. That is just remarkably small compared with a male prison population that's very frequently over 150,000 people. And so what we see when we look at women's prisons is not gangs. They're not highly organized. There's not lifetime commitments. They don't have the extensive written constitutions to guide their organizations. What you see instead is something much more decentralized and much looser. Um, there are people who occasionally affiliate with uh, other, other females who are incarcerated. It's not a binding, it's not a permanent thing. They don't segregate by race. They don't typically get, um, they don't have gangs. They call them um, families. And these families are much smaller. You know, pr prison gangs may be hundreds of members, uh, but these families are, are two or three people or four people. And women will take on a role as, a, as the mother or the father, and they'll have kids uh, who they look out for. Uh, that, that type of social organization actually is, is not terribly far removed from what male social organization looked like 
uh, prior to the formation of prison gangs. So male inmates in the 1940s didn't group up and call themselves families, but they had a, a, a much more um, a, a flexible, non-permanent, small group interactions with other inmates. Uh, so in that sense, um, I guess my argument fits pretty well in saying, well, um, the inmate demographics are very important here, and if you were to get dramatic increases of the female prison population, my prediction is that you, you would then see gangs forming amongst them. All right. Our next uh, question is from Sandy Pierre. Did I hear correctly that the rates of murder and suicide are low? From 1973 to 2003, there was a 94% decline in the inmate-on-inmate -inmate homicide rate in American prisons. And at that point in 2003, it was lower than the overall national homicide rate for the country. I think it was maybe 3.8% uh, in the prison system and uh, just over 4% nationally, maybe, but I, I don't quite remember exactly. Um, so that's kind of a shocking thing. And if you especially think about the communities that kind of the typical inmate or prisoner comes from is not the safest place in town, right? Very often people who are in prison come from the poorest areas where, where violence is most prominent, which would mean the difference between safety on the street and in prison is, is even more dramatic. <clears throat> Um, the, the, the data that I'm, I'm speaking about comes from an excellent book called The Prison State by a sociologist and economist, um, um, Yusim and Peel are their, their surnames. And what they document is that this isn't just an artifact of maybe um, prison doctors getting better, so that now when you get stabbed you don't die, whereas previously you would have. What they find is that even the more minor types of assaults are much less frequent. And so they look at inmate on inmate assaults. And so these assaults, like a fist fight, these have become much less uh, prominent and much less frequent as well. Suicides I have become less frequent. I don't remember the exact numbers. And I wouldn't say that maybe either of those reflect are better than in the community at all. That's specifically on the inmate on inmate uh, homicide rate. All right, uh, Chase Rin asks, uh, they hold elections? How is this possible? Do they need ID and where do Yeah, so, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating to just kind of get, you know, some of the details about how these groups work. And yeah, many of them do hold elections. So different gangs have different internal organizational structures. Some of them are, are very equal. There's not a high degree of hierarchy within the group. Others have substantial hierarchy within the group, four or five different standings that an inmate or an associate of that gang can, can fall into. Um, and the elections take place, um, majority rule, at the prison system, usually. Uh, excuse me, at, the, at the, the prison location. So if there's someone who's in charge of uh, a gang at a particular prison, he'll be elected by the members of that gang at that prison. And if he does his job well, he'll continue to stay in power. For a lot of gangs, they have impeachment processes where you can complain to other gang leaders uh, at that prison or at other prisons. Um, and it's a way to, to kind of control... Um, it, these groups need leadership, they need guidance. When disputes arise between different gangs, it is these gang leaders who will meet to adjudicate the dispute, to, des to decide how it can be resolved in a peaceful manner. You know, so to go back to the drug example, it will be gang leaders who get together and decide whether or not they're going to assault an individual or whether or not they're going to pay for him or whether or not he's going to assault a guard, for example. Uh, so the gang leadership is very important. So you want to get people who are reliable, who are knowledgeable, who understand kind of the dynamics. They call it gang politics um, of the prison community. And so elections are a way to harness um, that information. They, they're relatively smaller numbers, so there's actually a rational incentive to vote for these individuals and to participate. Uh, and, and for the same reason that they're so important, it's crucial that if someone does a very poor job of running things in the prison, that you get them out of power. Because when gang leaders do their job poorly, there's greater volatility, there's more violence, there's more conflict with other inmates. And the whole point of the gang system is partly to reduce the violence and the uncertainty that inmates uh, feel. Um. Michael Boston asks a question that is on many of our minds, I'm sure. How accurate is Orange is the New Black? Overall, overall not bad. Um, I mean, the, the, the key thing to remember is it, uh, there's definitely stuff that's in, like kind of 
you know, Hollywoodified um, about it. And the variation of someone's experience in either a male or a female prison is just, it's, it, there's, it's wide ranging. People have very different experiences. But um, overall, it's not bad. I mean, what we see in that show is that there's not highly organized prison gangs that require a lifetime commitment that have sophisticated internal structures. And given that female prisons typically are small and they rely on these family units, they capture that pretty well. There's also a substantial amount of, of interracial interactions in that show, which is which is true of female prisons in, in California, but that you would never see in, in a male prison on a male yard. Uh, so, so overall, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, it seems to depict uh, female prisons fairly well. A uh, follow-up question from me. Is there any uh, good media depiction of... I, I think that there are accurate depictions. There's two movies that are actually pretty good. One is called American Me, uh, which is loosely focused on um, uh, a gang from Southern California. And there's another movie called Blood In, Blood Out. And both of these uh, films look at uh, Hispanic uh, gangs in California. And for the most part, they're, they're fairly accurate. Lots of the documentaries of the American prison system provide uh, evidence and information that's consistent with the best academic literature. And um, it's, a, it's a very valuable resource. Um, so I, and I think that much of that information is accurate and true. Uh, but a lot of those types of depictions miss out on a very important part of prison communities, which is that when MSNBC goes in and interviews inmates, what the inmates say is very true and it's very useful and, and consistent with what we know about prisons. But what's very rarely or never shown is kind of the darker side of prison officials, right? So prison guards, I, presumably a relatively small percentage of them who facilitate the trafficking of drugs in the prison, for example, or who um, turn a blind eye to uh, gang assaults against vulnerable in individuals. Those types of things don't usually come through uh, quite as strongly, if at all. Natasha Petrova asks, so would you consider these gangs de facto states? I, I think it all comes down to the definition of, of what the state is. And um, uh, I think probably the answer is no. So if we use a Weberian definition of a legitimized monopoly on coercion in a given ter ter you know, territory, um, that's not true. There's multiple gangs that operate within the same, uh, the same area. Um, so they're not, uh, they wouldn't fit that well. Um, uh, an alternative definition uh, offered by uh, an economist named Randy uh, Holcomb is that a state, uh, this is actually kind of somewhat in line with Rothbard's definition, is that a state is any entity that can extract tribute or taxes from uh, most or everyone within a particular territory. Again, gangs can't really do that. So gangs do tax inmates, especially, or most importantly, inmates who are selling drugs in prison. They tax those proceeds, about a third uh, of the profits that they make on those things. But because the gangs are race-based, any particular gang can't tax everyone in that community. They can only tax a portion of them. So it, kind of it, fitting it up to these two um, definitions of states or governments, gangs are, are not either of those things. What's similar between gangs and governments is that they both provide social order. They provide stability, some predictability. They have some, they both provide governance, right? So at the start, I said that not all governments provide governance, right? Well, here's a situation where you have non-governments providing governance to some extent. Um, it, they fit well a sort of more cynical or public choice interpretation of states. So uh, these aren't um, benevolent dictators. There wasn't a social contract that you know, decided to, to build these things or, or to, they don't have a, any divine right to rule there, uh, but they, they, they provide governance and to the extent that modern governments do that, uh, there's, a, there's a very much an overlap between the two. Um, G. Borrego asks, uh, what's your view of... Um, so is, if the question is, are street gangs the same as prison gangs? Uh, then I think the answer is that in a in a, in some important ways, yes, they are. Um, so it's it is a very robust finding in criminology and sociology that the reason that people who join street gangs do so, the reason they say they do so, is because those gangs offer them protection. 
And that is precisely the same finding that we have uh, for uh, prison gangs. Uh, there's also a study in the Southern Economics Journal that looked at gang membership and gang violence in Los Angeles. And what they found, um, to kind of skip over the technical statistical details, is that um, the best predictor of when people join gangs, or they, what they did is they looked at the relationship between gang membership and gang violence. And the conventional wisdom would say that people join gangs and then there's more violence. What they found was the reverse, that when there was more violence, you would then subsequently see people joining gangs. And the interpretation and argument made by those economists was that this is consistent with the claim that people join gangs to protect themselves from the violence that's taking place rather than to promote violence. And again, that's very uh, similar to the, the type of argument that I'm making. Uh, Chase Rin asks uh, several questions. If the tax is too high, can the dealer change gangs? Uh, do these taxes work more like a fee for protection or are they mandatory? Or do the gangs compete for members by having lower taxes and better protection? <laughs> so a lot of great questions. Uh, we don't have great evidence for all of them. Uh, typically you can't switch gangs and that's for a variety of reasons. One is that very often your ethnic racial uh, background and where you grow up, where you're from matters. So in California, if you're Hispanic from Northern California, you're assumed to affiliate already with a, a one particular gang. But if you come from Southern California, you're basically going to be going into the other gang. So in that way, you can't switch between one or the other. And because these groups are racially segregated, it's very, very rare and, in fact, very dangerous for uh, people of uh, a Caucasian to join a, to join a black gang or, or the reverse. Um, so you can't easily switch. And moreover, when you join these gangs, um, nearly all of them um, in, the, in the typical setting, all of them require that you never leave the gang. So sometimes this is called the blood in, blood out requirement, which means that you have to assault someone to get in. And the only way that you can leave the gang is through your own death, through dying. Um, that's a very serious and actually a very credible, uh, um, uh, that's a very real threat. It's, it is not unknown to happen. People are killed when they drop out of gangs. So it's not easy to change. So there's not as much competition over what these gangs do, which is actually interesting uh, because it sounds a lot like sometimes governments are, right? It's not very easy to leave your country relative to leaving a restaurant, right? There's more concern that if you can't exit your interactions with a group, then you're going to be hesitant to enter one. So we just celebrated the 4th of July uh, yesterday. And you think back to the founding of the nation and the Federalist Papers and Madison. And what did Madison say? He said that the real challenge is that you want to empower a state to protect your rights. But in doing so, you're making it powerful enough that it could abuse your rights. And that very same situation works in the prison setting. You want to empower a gang enough to protect your rights, but if that gang taxes you too much or starts taking advantage of you, you want some way to, to stop that from happening. You want some, some assurance that that won't happen before you join the gang. And that's actually where a part of where these prison constitutions come in. You know, Madison wanted a constitution for the same reason that many of these gang members do. Because a gang and a government are both powerful and useful, but that those powers can be used against you if you're not careful. So they try to come up with ways to constrain uh, that, that type of predation. Um, and I guess the last question in that group was whether the taxes are more like a fee or are they mandatory? Well, they're very much mandatory. And the most powerful prison gangs like the Mexican Mafia require that you pay a third of the taxes, or excuse me, a third of the earnings that you make and, and when you sell uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, tobacco in prison. And the punishment for not doing so is, is very likely a, an assault. And the, the more often you don't pay the taxes or the greater the tax that goes unpaid, uh, the more serious that assault's going to be. Uh, what's surprising or, or maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes surprising to people who don't um, know very much about the prison system is that these gangs have very sophisticated communication networks. So even if you sell drugs in one prison, and you're not paying taxes there and nobody knows about it, if someone at another prison finds out about it, these gangs across different prisons have, uh, have networks where they send letters through people out on the street who send it back in. They smuggle notes in from one prison to another prison. And they keep long lists. They call them enemies lists or bad news lists or no good lists. And on these lists, they leave the names of inmates who violated some sort of gang rules. 
So if, if you were to go into a prison and sell drugs and not pay your tax or, or violate one of their other social rules and be transferred to another prison system, when that inmate arrives at the new prison system, if that gang's active there and all the major gangs are, then there's a gang leader, a shot caller, who's whose job is to identify all new inmates every day and give them an, an, an inmate questionnaire and ask them, what's your name? What's your street name? Where have you been incarcerated? What crimes have you been committed of? And they take that information and they cross check it against these enemies lists. So if you don't pay your gang taxes, if you violate other gang rules, there's ways for people to find out about this and to, and to punish you, to impose a cost for doing so. Thank you for that. Uh, our next question is from G. Borrego. Uh, any book recommendations on prison and street gangs, other than your own, obviously? Yeah, other than my own. So uh, um, there's, a, there's a couple of very good um, popular books um, or written for a non-academic audience. So mine, uh, you know, Matt can tell you if I'm wrong, but I, I try to make mine uh, engaging and readable enough that uh, non-academics will find it abuse. But it is primarily directed at an academic argument. I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of contribute to an academic literature. Um, but for, for just kind of fun or shocking um, enjoyment of reading, um, there's a couple of good ones. There's, there's one that is The Black Hand by Chris uh, Blatchford. This is on the Mexican Mafia, Southern California. It's very nicely done. There's a, a book um, by, I believe his name is Ramon Mendoza. It's Nuestra Familia. The title is something like um, The Time for a New Paradigm. And this is someone who was in the Nuestra Familia prison gang for, for many years. And it's a very detailed and, and very well written um, for the genre uh, explanation of kind of what gang life is there. Um, one other academic book I'll mention on the street gangs is a classic by um, uh, called Islands in the Street, uh, which is kind of mandatory reading in this literature. Um, Antoinette Sapaco asks, uh, what happens to people who resist joining? Can they avoid it? So there is some ability to avoid um, gang activity or gang association. And uh, one option is to affiliate with a religious group. So in the same way that gangs are responsible for their members' actions, if you're a churchgoer, then the people who you affiliate with are responsible for your actions there. Um, a second way to avoid gang, uh, I mean, a kind of a serious gang commitment, is to avoid all of the underground economy activities. So you can go to prison and have a very tenuous, very limited affiliation with your racial group and not have to go and kill people or anything like that, as long as you're not trying to uh, be an, an active participant in the illicit markets. If you're going to do that, then you need, you need that gang security and gang assurance. Uh, there's also uh, the opportunity to drop out of the general population, the mainline prison populations. In California, you can enter protective custody, a special needs yard, and this is a situation, this is a yard that is exclusively for people who are not safe in the general mainline population. So these are people who are typically not seen well in the prison community and often assaulted. So, so we're talking about sex offenders, informants, former police officers. These people are assaulted when they go to the general population. So instead of going there and being harmed, officials will put them onto a separate yard, also with gang dropouts, uh, in order to avoid that, that gang activity. Now, what's interesting about this is that it is uh, a community of the people who are most despised amongst inmates generally. So going there is very costly, so reinforcing the idea that it's very costly to drop out of a prison gang because then you have to live amongst the people that they view as the lowest um, uh, in, the, in the kind of social hierarchy. And the second interesting thing is that even though you take these people out of the mainline general population, what we've seen in California recently is these uh, SNY or special needs yards gangs popping up. So even people who are actively seek not to be gang members have found that they still need those gangs for that protection and for that order. Now, the membership in the special you know, SNY gangs isn't as uh, serious. It's not necessarily the lifetime. There are some non-lifetime membership prison gangs in the SNY yards. Um, but what's, what it reveals is that there's this need for that extra legal governance, even for those people who aren't kind of the hardcore gangbangers in the general population. So it's very limited opportunity to stay away from those things. Um, um, 
Uh, I heard an interesting example from from one individual who I interviewed with, and he said, if you want to not be in a prison gang in the mainline population, you know, you, you have a chance to get through all right. But he said, think about this example. If I want to smuggle drugs into a more secure area of the facility, uh, a place where it's kind of a jail within a jail, then I have to I have to do something to earn being put in that restrictive housing. And a common and easy thing to do is to get into a fight, and then they'll throw you in the tough uh, the the prison within the prison, and I can smuggle you know heroin to to other people there. He says in an environment like that where I need to fight someone strictly for a functional reason. Who will I fight? Will I fight the people who are strongly affiliated with the gang? Or will I find people who are excuses, people who uh, have no gang affiliation? He says, those are the easy people. Just assault them, and then you don't have to ruffle feathers of anyone that you respect or know or have a relationship with. Uh, Natasha Petrova asks, uh, do you consider prison gang governance to be anarchistic? And do you consider prison gangs an argument against anarchism? That's a, that's a really, I mean, really a great question. I mean, I think that, I mean, so, I mean, maybe I should kind of preface this with just saying that my main, my main interest is in, as you know, economics is a positive science. So I, I'm, I have kind of interesting ideological or normative questions, but the investigation here is, is, is to say, well, let's look at the strange environment in prison where people are not as, are less cooperative than the general community. They don't have as many exit options. Order is important, you know, so how does it work there? So it's very much this kind of Eleanor Ostrom style approach of studying institutions and saying, let's go look at unique environments and see what types of institutions, you know, bubble up there. Um, so the anarchist question, um, you could interpret it in, in two ways. You could say that these gangs are a lot like governments and, um, and if you think that the gangs are providing uh, a, a good set of institutions and good outcomes, then this would be kind of a quasi-government providing good outcomes, and that would be an argument against um, a lot of anarchist positions. Alternatively, you could say, well, these aren't really governments, um, and so what's emerging is more like a homeowners association or um, kind of a fraternal society. And so even though there's a little bit of violence, sometimes governments use violence, sometimes gangs use violence. Well, I mean, they, they've got limited options. So this is, you know, kind of a, an opportunity to, to look at an environment where the people who we would assume are least cooperative in society are able to be cooperative enough to facilitate fairly large volumes of illicit goods and services. So in that sense, you've got kind of a source of authority and power coming, not imposed from the top by the government, but from within the group. Um, emerging to to kind of promote um, outcomes in, in society that, that the people there like. So it, it, it's not kind of an obvious or clear case for either. I don't know very many people who would actively seek out to live under uh, a set of governance institutions like those that exist in prison. Uh, so it's certainly not the best case scenario. There's many, many bad governments, and I think that you could make an argument that these gangs, in, in, in some ways, do better than those bad governments. Um, but it, it's not kind of a, uh, a strong, I guess it depends on what type of argument you're making on whether or not this is like a pro or, or anti-anarchy uh, style argument. Um, another question from me. I, I had the idea uh, coming into reading the book that prison gangs were an outgrowth of uh, street gangs and that the the gangs you saw in the prisons were just the gangs mm. you saw outside of the prisons. Now, it, it seems I, I've, I've just read, uh, I think this morning or last night, that that's not actually the case. Uh, could you talk? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the, the street gang connection in, in criminology is one of the more um, well-accepted explanations for where gangs exist. And if you take a case of, say, the prison system in Illinois, it fits pretty well. So what you had there is you had a large number of street gangs and the street gang memberships increasing and those members start getting incarcerated. And when they're incarcerated, they're just they're starting up their street gang again, but this time in prison. And so they call this the importation theory of prison gangs. And the idea is that you import the organizational structure of the street gang into the prison system. And that explains you know, why we have prison gangs. Um, so Illinois is actually a case where that is descriptively very accurate. 
The problem is that if we look at other states, that relationship doesn't seem to hold very well. So if you look at California, uh, this is a place that has a long history of street gangs and a very uh, early presence of prison gangs. Uh, but it doesn't line up very well. Street gangs existed in, in uh, California in maybe 1910, 1930 at the latest. Well, we don't see prison gangs form there until the 1950s. That means that there's somewhere between like a 20 and 50 year lag between the emergence of street gangs and then the existence of prison gangs. So that doesn't line up very well. And if we look at other states like Pennsylvania or Utah, these are states that had a very little or no street gang presence, but they had prison gangs forming at a very early stage, right? So there's lots of prison gangs, prison gang activity, prison gang members in states where there was not a substantial street gang presence. So all of these types of examples undermine the logic of that importation model of, of uh, prison gang formation. And then when you look at the historical experience, like the actual gangs that formed in California, it also directly contradicts the importation model outside of Illinois. So the first gang to form in California is the Mexican Mafia. This wasn't a street gang that reconstituted itself behind bars. It was a combination of many different Hispanic street gangs in California who um, all chose to start a new organization with a different structure and a different name inside the prison system. The second prison gang in California that came into existence is the Nuestra Familia. And uh, those individuals who comprised that gang were specifically people who were not street gang members. They were preyed upon by street gang members who were in prison. They were preyed upon by Mexican mafia members. So these Mexican mafia members found a bunch of rural farm workers and started stealing from them, started abusing them. So they grouped together for protection to fight back against those individuals. So those are, again, powerful, real, historical arguments that just don't, aren't, there's no sense made of them uh, by this importation story. So is there anything, what is the relationship then between street gangs and prison gangs? Um, I, I like to think about it as a supply and demand issue, right? So everything makes more sense with supply and demand, um, I find. And the way to think about this is that the supply of governance, so think of the supply of governance, the people who are going to provide the protection, who are going to provide the assurance, who are going to you know, facilitate the underground economy, and then the demand for, for governance. So people who demand protection, people who demand assurance in the markets, people who demand illegal goods. So the street gang members are, are, have a comparative advantage in providing the supply of governance in prisons today. These are people who work with illegal drugs uh, out in the community. There are people who um, are tough, who are willing to use violence. So these are people with just the right tools to provide governance and they often do it on the street. And when they get to prison, you know, it could be that that person's going to provide the governance or it could be that a librarian who's been incarcerated is going to provide it. Well, who do you think is going to do a better job at that? It's going to be the street gang member. So there's a very real relationship there um, in that the street gang members have an advantage in supplying governance. And that's the relationship. But um, it doesn't explain well kind of the historical uh, variation in when they emerge. And maybe I'll just note one other relationship between the street gangs and prison gangs is that street gangs um, are very often now, as these prison gangs have come, become quite powerful in California, street gang members sometimes seek out kind of promotion. It's kind of like a big deal if you can become a prison gang member. This is like kind of the elite of those communities. Um, and when street gangs um, sell drugs in California, Hispanic street gangs pay taxes on the drugs to uh, leaders and members of the Mexican Mafia prison gang. So there's a relationship already developing there. And for a young individual who sees that as kind of a great way to go in life, um, they're going to seek out to develop a relationship with those people and, and to progress into that. So uh, there's a, a clear kind of connection between the two, but it doesn't explain where, when prison gangs come into existence. Natasha Petrova asks, uh, would you argue that prison gangs reinforce tribalism? It depends a little bit what, what you mean by tribalism. If you mean tribalism as in like clan-based society, so all around the world throughout history, much of social order has been created through um, the clan. Uh, the clan. There's a great book by Mark Weiner called The Rule of the Clan, and he looks at the organization of these clan types in places like Somalia, the Middle East, Africa, all over throughout time. When social, in communities where people don't have access to strong, effective governments, the clan is just a very common way to organize your relation. 
So what's interesting in studying uh, his book and, and the, the work on clans is that clans have a very similar social obligation as the prison gang members do. If you're in a clan, your honor is dependent on the clan's honor. Your place in society is not as a person, but as a member of a particular clan. And that's precisely the relationship that exists in the, in the prison system. You are, it is not who you are that matters, but the reputation of the gang that matters. You don't make decisions on your own. Your honor and your respect and your place, your safety, depend on what that gang as a whole is doing. So there's a lot of, in that sense, if that's the type of tribalism that you're curious about, there's just a dramatic amount of, of overlap between the two groups. And what we see um, is instead of kinship relationships, as in clans, what fictive kinship relationships. So people get tattoos uh, that identify their allegiance in the same way that people will know individual in the community by who they're related to. Here you're related through a fictive kinship. So there's a similarity very much between the two. Both groups also kind of have exclusive membership. You're either a member of this clan uh, or you're not. You can't be a member of multiple clans. In prison, it's the same way. You can't be a member of multiple gangs. And the reason is because if you're a member of multiple gangs, then who's responsible for you when you don't pay your debts? Is it you know, gang A or gang B? Or if you're in gang A and then you move to gang B and you have an unpaid debt, who, who, to whom can people look to for redress? Um, so there's substantial overlap between uh, the organization of gang society and what we see in the, in the broader world. When there's an absence of, of effective government governance, clans emerge. And that's basically my argument about the American prison system, that booming uh, prison population numbers has created an environment where officials can't provide the governance, the protection that inmates want. So they turn to gangs, clans, uh, to provide that social order for them. Uh, Sandy Pierre asks, many people in California are bi or multiracial. How do, are those people grouped into gangs? Uh, which gang would Tiger Woods go into? So this is uh, a fascinating question. There's a sense in which there's not one right answer. So I think it's going to be very context dependent. So for example, um, if an individual has you know, black and Hispanic uh, parents, when that person enters the prison system, if they already have some affiliation with street gang members or members who they know who are incarcerated that are in one gang or the other, then very naturally you're going to kind of move into that community. So you can choose you know, kind of choose your identity and which group that you're gonna uh, you're going to affiliate with. There's situations where um, you you won't have a choice, and uh, so, so some groups, some um, some um, some white gangs say that you can have a, a Hispanic parent but no black parents, and that will you know that's sufficient to get into our group. Um, so a lot of this is going to depend on what's your history, what what are your social connections, what are your social networks. And even if you're if you're if you're biracial, if you have substantial history and experience and reputation with you know one set of people rather than the other, then that's going to kind of naturally push you into that that community. And I don't know about Tiger Woods. All right, um, and uh, a last question uh, from me: uh, Do you think that if gangs were allowed to become more formalized that uh, prison violence would do. Well, I mean, in a way, I, I'm arguing that I, what we've seen is a, a high degree of formalization among the gangs and at the same time a dramatic increase in violence. Now, other things have changed during that period. So prison management has gotten a lot better, arguably, during that same period. Uh, but so is gang management of prisons. Um, prison gang members in kind of uh, you know personal accounts, when you interview inmates, when you talk to people, they say things like, "Look, prison gangs are a problem, but they also provided a lot of solutions. So if you want people to resolve disputes, if you want people to set rules, and they do set rules, you can't insult people in certain ways. You can't yell down the tear. You, there's a set bedtime in some prisons, like San Quentin, where each racial group says goodnight to all other inmates. And then after that, it's lights out. And the rules dictate that if you're loud and causing trouble, there's going to be repercussions for that. So there's ways in which these gangs create rules that any, I mean, any overcrowded large population where even breathing space or moving space is really scarce, you want people to create rules to regulate that. And gangs do that, and to that extent, it benefits inmates. They, the, maybe the connection that we haven't really discussed yet is 
uh, why gangs don't want violence in prison. So they don't want chaotic or spontaneous acts of violence. If a riot kicks off, prison officials are going to put many or all inmates on some severe lockdown in the housing area. That's not good for people because they want to get time out of their cell. And if you can't get out of your cell, it's much more difficult to sell a lot of drugs and make money and to buy drugs. So gangs profit by selling drugs and they can only sell drugs if things are relatively order and if they, if they put a cap or if they constrain chaotic acts of violence. So violence is heavily regulated. Two people won't just get into a fist fight on the yard. They have to get permission from the gangs to get into a fist fight and they won't do it on the yard. They'll do it in a cell somewhere. They'll have a, what they call a cell fight to adjudicate that. So that doesn't speak exactly to your question, Matt, because it, 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 I'm not making a claim about the overall level of violence. Um, but there's a, at least a very real first order, first order effect where gangs um, reduce violence. That, that's very much true. Thank you so much. Uh, this was, as uh, Chase says in chat, amazingly informative. I'm looking forward to finishing the book. and Everyone should check it out. I'll post the, uh, the Amazon link to it here in just a second. Uh, Thanks so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you, David, for speaking to us. Everyone take thanks care. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for the questions.